Okay, welcome everybody to today's class. I have a couple of students at the moment who are preparing for IELTS writing. And that's why this class is about how to get a great mark on IELTS writing. But actually the same points apply to CAE writing, CPE writing, FCE writing, and I think any kind of writing really, any time you're writing some kind of academic essay, you ought to consider some of these points. Okay, so there are many things you can think about if you've got an exam ahead of you. Maybe you've got FCE, maybe you've got CAE, something like that. You need to think about these points. Now, I've taken these titles, Task Achievement, Coherence and Cohesion, um, lexical resource and grammatical range and accuracy. I've taken them from the uh, criteria that IELTS examiners use to decide whether you get band 6, band 7, band 8, band 9. They, they judge you on the following four categories. And so we're going to look at what they really mean because I think most people wouldn't say task achievement, coherence and cohesion. What are they actually talking about? What are they actually looking for? And I'm glad to say that actually it's fairly straightforward, it's fairly logical and rational and sensible what they want from you. Because I think that this is really what examiners use, it's what examiners look for in the GCSEs. GCSEs are state exams in the UK for English. Um, it's what examiners look for in the A-levels and it's what university examiners are looking for when they mark your work as well. So it is really not just IELTS writing, but writing in general, how to improve your writing when you're doing an exam, because obviously examiners, they, they look at certain criteria. So firstly, they're judging you on task achievement. Now this really does mean, did you answer the question? I've marked quite a few papers nowadays, not just for IELTS, but I've marked quite a few writing, um, quite a few essays that people have given me in answer to FCE questions or CAE questions. And quite often, people don't answer the question. Now that might seem quite strange, but uh, they, they just make a mistake. They read the question and then they decide that they're gonna start talking about something different. They digress, they move off the point. And if you do that, you'll definitely get a low mark for task achievement. So number one, read the question carefully. And as you're writing your essay, constantly go back to that question and just ask yourself, am I answering the question? Am I directly answering that question? Or have I decided to write about something else that I know more about or that I'm more interested in? Because you don't want to do that. This isn't about what you're interested in and it's not about what you know about. You have to answer the question. So if it's a question about the environment, and let's face it, it very often is. If it's a question about the environment or about global warming and CO2 emissions, you've really got to be talking about those things. You can't start talking about something else. Even if it's something that seems indirectly related, you can't do that. You've got to answer the question fully and directly, and that question and not some other question that you've decided is also important. Okay, so I can't stress that enough because a number of times now I've looked at the essay and thought, it's a good essay, not many mistakes, and they've used a wide range of grammatical structures and that's all good, but the question hasn't been answered. And you really wanna look at your conclusion here, the last paragraph of the essay, one second, I'm just gonna get my coffee. You wanna look at your conclusion and check that in your conclusion, you've actually answered the question. Look at the question, look at your conclusion, and ask yourself, does my conclusion answer that question or does it answer somebody else's question? Does it answer one of my questions? Because unfortunately, if that's the case, you've wasted a lot of that time, a lot of the time you've spent on the essay, you've wasted that time answering a different question. So answer the question directly and specifically. Um, pay attention to the question and keep coming back to the question in order to understand if you've answered it and to keep it in mind, because it's very easy to digress. Okay, so every sentence is relevant. Some people have a habit of trying to fill the essay up with unnecessary words. And by unnecessary words, I mean 
strange sentences that start with something like, I think that this is probably the case, full stop, and then the next sentence. You can get rid of sentences like that. Some sentences are so unclear that you want to just get rid of them. Every sentence must be relevant. Every sentence counts. You've only got 250 words or 150 words. And if you're wasting some of those precious words, you're not going to get a good mark. So this is not an exam where you're trying to fill the essay up to make it as big as possible so that you've got 250 words. We all, we've all been there. We've all done that before. And uh, it's not going to get you a high mark. Please avoid that. Every sentence must be relevant. Every word but must be necessary. And really, this is an aspect of good writing. Good writers don't use unnecessary words. Good writers don't use unnecessary sentences. Okay, so no words are wasted. I'm just repeating myself really, but I hope I'm drilling home this point that you don't want to waste words. You don't want to put sentences in there that have no real um, input. They don't really answer the question in any way. They're unnecessary. Okay. Now, thirdly, and there's a lot of confusion about this, both sides of the argument must be taken into account. This is what's also known as a balanced essay. So does this mean that you have to say that both sides are correct, the arguments for and the arguments against? No, it doesn't mean that. You certainly can choose what side of the argument you're going to support and you're going to defend, and you should do. But what you shouldn't do is ignore your opposition. Yeah, ignoring the opposition is a sign of weakness. It's a sign that you're not able to show where their argument is flawed. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to give the argument of the op opposing side. Yeah, perhaps you're arguing in favour of, um, I don't know, reducing taxes. It's unlikely, I must admit, but perhaps you're arguing in favour of that. You still have to say why the opposition is in favour of raising taxes. And then you can use concrete examples to show why they are wrong and why you are right. Yeah. And so both sides of the argument are taken into account. And this is why I actually recommend you have an introduction, then arguments for, then arguments against. And these will be your biggest paragraphs, of course. Um, have arguments for, arguments against, and then a short conclusion. Um, I recommend following that general um, structure. Um, so make sure you look at both sides of the argument. But if you're against one side of the argument, and I think it's good to, ch to choose a side, I, I do. I don't think it's good to sit on the fence, as we say. Um, although you can do if you really feel like there are strong arguments on both sides. Sure, say that and make sure you say that in the conclusion that there are strong arguments on both sides. But a, little, a lot of the time you won't think so. And if you have chosen your position that you're arguing in favour of reducing taxes, then uh, still show why some people are in favour of the opposite. State what argument they use and then show where their argument is flawed. OK, so that's what I mean by a balanced essay. Do mention the arguments for and the arguments against. Talk about your opposition. That shows strength. It shows you're not afraid of your opponent's opinion. You're not afraid of their argument. You're able to show where their argument is misleading or where their argument is mistaken. OK, come to a conclusion that directly and fully answers the question. You've probably noticed I'm repeating myself. I'm just saying here, look at your conclusion and make sure it answers that question. So many times I read the conclusion and I feel like the student's written an essay for a different question. It must be for that question and the conclusion should be directly answering that question and maybe even showing, um, developing it a little bit further, perhaps going a little bit further, which you can do in the conclusion. Last point, there should be zero contradictions. This is a zero, not an O. There should be no contradictions. If there are any contradictions in your essay, that will look poor. And of course, this is always the case. If you contradict yourself, you don't sound very convincing. So if you've written in the introduction that you're arguing in favour of reducing taxes, and in the conclusion you say, therefore, it would be a mistake 
to uh, reduce taxes, you are contradicting yourself and your introduction and conclusion, they contradict and you'll get a poor mark for task achievement and uh, you'll probably get a poor mark for coherence and cohesion as well. And so you mustn't do that, do not contradict yourself. I do sometimes read contradictions in the essay and um, if there are any contradictions, it, it makes me tear my hair out because it really, <laughs> you can't do that. You don't do it in your speech. You try not to contradict yourself in your speech. Don't do it in your writing either because it doesn't sound good there either. Um, okay, so one thing to make sure of is that you read the essay one more time. Yeah, do read your own work one more time to check everything. Check spelling, check coherence, check that you're using full sentences, check that you haven't missed a full stop, check that you haven't missed a punctuation mark. Yeah, all of those things are very easy to do. We all do it. And so certainly check if you've got some time at the end. Okay, coherence and cohesion. This is really the idea that a lot of the time, if you're writing a formal discursive essay, you know, this isn't the case for writing a letter to a friend, and I know that's in the general IELTS, and so you don't want to necessarily use this structure for that. But for the discursive essay, introduction, where you rephrase the question, yeah, you rephrase it, you look at what question they've asked you, and you rephrase it in your own language, in your own words, um, and you indicate the approach you will take to answer the question. So indicate what, what from from what position you're going to argue and how the, how the essay is going to be structured. So if you're talking about taxes, state that the essay will firstly consider arguments in favour of reducing taxes and then arguments against reducing taxes. Yeah, State that, make sure that the reader knows where they're going and the introduction shouldn't really be more than two or three sentences. You don't need more than two or three to rephrase the question and tell the reader what approach you're going to take. That's just nice and clear then, the reader knows exactly where he is, where he stands and where he's going. Now. Arguments for then, arguments against, so you want two paragraphs here, make sure you use paragraphs. If you're not using paragraphs, you're already making sure that you get band five or six or four even. So you're putting your mark right down here below the board if you don't use paragraphs. Same goes for if you're not using capital letters or something like that. Don't do that. It would be a, a really big mistake to not use capital letters or, or you know, simple punctuation marks, make sure that you, you, you do uh, follow the basic rules of spelling and punctuation. And you ought to have a conclusion that directly answers the question. But one more thing, concrete examples in arguments for and arguments against. This very often means examples from your life. They like that, the examiners, if you use real examples from your life to back up your arguments, you must support your arguments with examples, real examples, because it makes your arguments stronger. It gives them a basis. The reader understands why you're arguing in, in favour or against something if you give them concrete examples of why it's good or why it's bad. Okay, so concrete examples here in both parts. There needs to be concrete examples of why you agree or why you disagree. Now we're going to come on to some of the more, um, perhaps more interesting stuff, but you'll have to watch a lot of other videos to, to, uh, to, to appreciate the full range that you can be using here. So a range of linking words is important for coherence and cohesion. Linking words are words like firstly, secondly, moreover, besides, in conclusion, in summary, um, on the one hand, on the other hand, all of those linking words are really useful and if you're using the same linking words throughout the essay that's going to immediately put your mark down. If you're using a range of linking words that's going to raise your mark. So use a range of linking words and if you want to know more linking words you can find a playlist that I've got on YouTube called linking words. So if you just type in Mr Skype lessons linking words you'll find a playlist of nine videos. So 
What are linking words? Well, they're conjunctions, fanboys conjunctions, and I've got a video on coordinating conjunctions. You'll definitely be using those. I'm sure you'll be using some of those because they're words like and and but. And so you'll be using those. And I don't think you need to make an effort to use those because we all use those. But use subordinating conjunctions as well. Yeah, you must use some subordinating conjunctions. If you don't use any subordinate clauses in your essay, you're going to get a really low mark. We all need to use some subordinate clauses. So some sentences ought to start with although, while, whereas. They're lovely contrasting words that will get your point across. It will get your message across to the examiner. So make sure you look at some videos. I've got some online on subordinating conjunctions because that will help your punctuation as well. Anytime you start with a subordinating conjunction, you'll need a comma in the middle for subordinate clause, comma, main clause. And if you want more information about that, try my punctuation videos. I've got loads of punctuation videos. And um, as well as subordinating conjunctions and subordinate clauses, so definitely use those. And this is what I mean by a complex sentence. A complex sentence is a subordinate and a main clause. A compound sentence is two mains. So you want some sentences with two mains, some sentences with a subordinate and a main. As well as the subordinating conjunctions, you want to learn some conjunctive adverbs. And I talk about these in the video that I have on semicolons and colons. And the reason why I want you to use a conjunctive adverb is that it's also a very good way of putting a semicolon into your essay. If you look at how conjunctive adverbs are used, they're very often used right next to a semicolon. And they're going to be used correctly. If you use main clause, semicolon, conjunctive adverb, comma, main clause, it looks good. It looks very much like you know how to punctuate. Now, bear in mind, a lot of English people don't learn these rules at school. In fact, I'd say the majority don't learn anything about conjunctive adverbs. I'm talking about Brits here. I don't know about the Americans. I think they do learn a lot of this at school. But please get a conjunctive adverb in there and get a semicolon in there. That's already a range of punctuation, a range of grammatical structures. And that's what you're looking for. Yeah, you need a grammatical range and you need a range of punctuation marks. Make sure you get a semicolon in there by putting in a conjunctive adverb. Why not? It's really simple. It's easy to do. These words are like however, moreover, nevertheless. Um, these are all conjunctive adverbs. Please watch the video on semicolons for more information. Lastly, correlative conjunctions. You've got to use these guys. They're really useful for showing uh, contrast and comparison. And very often in these essays, you're comparing different things. So you really need to use correlative conjunctions. These are expressions like not only X, but also Y. And you can find out more about these correlative conjunctions by look, watching my video called X and Y conjunctions. Now, correlative conjunctions are really interesting devices to use in your essay, partly because a lot of the time they use inversion. And inversion is over here on our list of grammatical range, lots of different interesting grammatical structures we can use. So when you use not only, you need inversion. Not only did I, not only would I, not only have I, you invert the subject and the auxiliary verb, which sounds impressive. It sounds good. So please use correlative conjunctions because you get the chance to use inversion and you get the chance to show a good comparison with an excellent device, a correlative conjunction. And it shows you know a range of conjunctions. You know how to use a range of conjunctions. So notice that to do all of these things, you've got to be writing in some ways better than the average native speaker, but that's fine. The average native speaker won't necessarily use a range of correlative conjunctions or conjunctive adverbs. They probably won't use any semicolons. So you can do this. You can actually get your essay to a higher level by following these tips, by using all of the um, resources at your disposal. So lexical resource, you've got to use a wide range of vocabulary. Now, somebody mentioned earlier, should I use phrasal verbs in an essay? Well, that's not really the right question. The right question is, should I use phrasal verbs in the informal or the formal part of the exam? Because there are formal essays, discursive essays, and there are informal letters to a pen friend, for example, or a college friend. 
Now, if it's informal, use lots of informal phrasal verbs. If it's formal, probably best to look at the Latin equivalents. And I've got a lesson on formal versus informal language. You can find it, Mr. Skype lessons, formal, informal. And that will look at some of the different ways you can express yourself. It will look at words which are formal and then, look at, then it looks at their informal equivalents. So you can look at that, make sure you're using the right style and that will get you a high mark on the lexical resource part. Also, make sure you've got some excellent collocations. Now, one way to really improve your writing is to use a wide range of adjectives. Please watch my video on gradable and ungradable adjectives, because when you watch that video, you'll find out about how to put an adverb in front of an adjective. If it's gradable, you'll need to use very, really, or, um, or very, or um, um, extremely. And if it's ungradable, you might want to use something like utterly or absolutely. And that already is a good collocation. Yeah, if you say something like um, the, um, it was absolutely perfect, something like that. You've got a nice collocation in there. There are many others, and being honest, perhaps that's quite a boring one, but please use lots of different adjectives and bear in mind if they're gradable or ungradable. Please use adverb collocations. I've got four videos on adverb collocations. There's a whole playlist there again. There are loads of different adverb collocations. If you've got some memorized and you put some in your essay, it will improve the mark for lexical resource, yeah? Which just means good vocabulary. That's all it means, a nice wide range of vocabulary with excellent collocations. So please watch those videos, they'll come in handy. Good spelling, well, unfortunately, you know, I really sympathize here. I find it difficult to spell English words as well. They are a nightmare. And that's why if you watch these videos all the way through, you'll see one or two spelling mistakes, hopefully not more than that. But you don't want to make too many spelling mistakes because of course this will bring the mark down. Have, try to be careful with your spelling. And the only way to do that is practice. And being honest, of course, to write well, practice is key keep writing essays and getting them marked and write some more and get them marked. Appropriate vocab for the topic. So partly this is formal informal, but also if you're writing about environment, you'll need a lot of environment words. You yeah? have a lot of environmental vocabulary. You can find the, this vocabulary on my vocabulary lessons. I've got loads of vocabulary lessons on loads of different topics, crime, clothes, weather, environment. So watch those lessons and try to absorb as much of that vocabulary as you can. So lastly, grammatical range and accuracy. Accuracy is simple, correct grammar. Yeah, it's always good to write without mistakes. No doubt about that. So try to keep mistakes to a minimum. I think that's obvious to everybody. It's patently obvious. There's a good adverb collocation. Um, but please use a range of structures. Now, I've spoken about this in my How to Improve Your English videos. There are five videos called How to Improve Your English, or three or four. If you write Mr. Skype Lessons, How to Improve Your English in the search bar, you will find them. And it shows you on these videos, I go into great detail about how to use, well, not how to, but I, I emphasize that you really must use a range of different sentences. Now. You start by doing this in your writing and eventually it starts to crop up in your speaking. So your speaking improves as well. But for writing, please use compound sentences and complex sentences. So do use subordinate clauses, do use subordinating conjunctions. If you're not sure what they are, watch the video on subordinating conjunctions. I've got one. And so once you've watched that video, you'll learn a lot of new vocabulary, hopefully. And it will also tell you about the idea that if you start with a subordinate clause, you need a comma before the main clause. So certainly though, use those two, but don't only use those two because that will still be a very simple essay. Use passives, use modals in complex forms. A couple of days ago, I made a lesson about complex gerunds, participles, and infinitives. And modals are actually a lot easier than the gerunds and participles to put into complex forms. It always looks good if you have a 
could have done, must have done, should have done, if you have these expressions as well in there. Don't have too many, you know, one is plenty in the essay. Don't make every sentence a complex modal, but certainly use a range. So you want to use passives in various forms, various tenses. You want to use modals. You want to use inversion. This is easy if you've got an X and Y conjunction. It's easy. Not only did I, would I, you've already got inversion. Use parallel structure. I've got a lot of videos on parallel structure, please. If you don't know what that means, put it into the search bar and you'll see that parallel structure again is very important for X and Y conjunctions. It's a perfect opportunity to show that you can use parallel structure. Use cleft sentences. Again, there's another video on this. If you're not sure what that means, have a look because once you've found out what it means, you can use it in your essay and the examiner will be impressed if he sees a wide range of different types of sentences. Use fronting, front adjectival phrases, front adverbial phrases. You can put a comma after them as well to show that you know how to use the comma. But putting these adjectival adverbial phrases at the front sounds very nice. And so I've got some videos on fronting. Again, put it into the search bar for more information. A positives are great. Make sure there's at least one A positive in there. Writers use them all the time. Read the first couple of pages of Animal Farm and you'll see hundreds of A positives all over the place. Every time an animal is introduced, you get the name and the type of the animal and it's a, a, an A positive. So please watch the videos on A positives if you're thinking what the hell are A positives. And it's true that most natives don't know what an A positive is, is certainly the case. But you want to get rid of this idea that you need to know English like a native knows English, um, or as a native knows English, which would be more formal. Um, you've got to get rid of this idea. You need to know English better than a native knows English. And that simply involves learning some of this some of the different complex forms that you can use. Now, of course, you're going to always have some mistakes in your language, but don't worry because natives certainly have mistakes in their language as well. And so try to learn as many different types of uh, grammatical structures and you will get a better mark if you include a wide range in your answer. So A positives, subjunctive as well. And if you're not sure about subjunctive, yeah, I've got a lesson on it. Conditionals, please use if sentences, not loads, ones enough, but it's good to show that you know how to use a conditional as well. And there are lots of different conditional forms. You don't have to use if, you can obviously use unless, um, until, uh, provided that, on condition that, there are a number of them. And I've put rhetorical devices down here, but I have put it in brackets because I think that that's really quite challenging to, to use um, a rhetorical device in an essay. But if you get the chance to, if you can feel a nice rhetorical device that you could use, please, why not? I mean, if it seems appropriate, but be careful here. I mean, we're not writing poetry and so don't go overboard. Don't uh, try to, I mean, don't try to show off too much because sometimes that leads to mistakes. It leads to incorrect sentences. So be careful. Um, use sentences and sentence structures that you're confident with, but please use a wide range of them. You will get a much higher mark on grammatical range and accuracy if it's not just the same simple sentences, compound sentences. Um, there's nothing interesting about them, basically. Okay, so I'm afraid that one of the things you've learned today is that you need to find more information on other videos. But the good news is there are other videos that are out there. They're already prepared. And I'm not the only one with videos on these themes. Of course, there are loads of people out there with videos on these themes. But uh, if, if anyone wants to improve their mark or finds that they can't get above a seven and a half and they're not sure why, Ask yourself if you're obeying all of these rules. Ask yourself if you are thinking about all of these different points, because it's probably one of these topics that's bringing down your mark. And if you just make sure that you use a good range of sentences or a good range of excellent collocations or a good range of linking words, or maybe just make sure you answer the question directly and fully with concrete examples, um, you ought to get a high mark. So I hope that's been useful for everybody. Um, if you 
stay subscribed to the channel and stay on the channel. I'll, I'll make a few more lessons in the next few days. Perhaps not IELTS writing, but um, something that might be connected in some kind of way. Okay, thanks everybody for watching and I hope to see you all soon.